On July 20th, 1798, an envoy began a voyage across the Atlantic. Only two days later, a second, all to join an ambassador to a country which little over a decade they had fought side by side with. The mission was of great importance, to prevent war. When they arrived, they were denied of any negotiations. Instead, three men spoke to them, informing them that without a bribe, they would not be seen. These former allies were the fledgling republics of America and revolutionary France, and this diplomatic failure would later be known as the XYZ Affair, which would spiral into the Quasi-War. The Quasi-War was a relatively short conflict, lasting from 1798 to 1800, and is often referred to as an undeclared war. Though generally less known, the Quasi-War is of huge importance, tasking the United States with its first major challenge to neutrality, choosing a future which aligned more with the French or British, and re-establishing the U.S. Navy. While the Quasi-War may have started during 1798, the background of the conflict started much earlier. In a way, the conflict actually sprouted from America and France's allyship, for after being pivotal in helping the Americans beat back the British and birth their new republic, the Americans owed the French a debt for their services, a debt which was especially important at the time because the new French Republic was dangerously low on funds. However, the Americans refused, stating that their debt was with the now overthrown government. In addition, beginning in 1794 and effective in 1796, the Americans had signed a treaty with the British, known as the Jay Treaty, which established several things. It established that Britain would abandon forts in North America, that American ships could not trade in the British West Indies at a limit not exceeding 70 tons, that American ships could trade in India, uh, but it also made it so that America would not permit enemies of Britain to operate warships from American ports or sell their prizes there, that Britain could now take enemy goods from neutral ships, that American ships could not carry molasses, sugar, coffee, cocoa, and cotton to anywhere but the United States, all items integral to American trade. Luckily for the Americans, this last proposal called Article 12 was largely unenforced. The treaty also established a 10-year guarantee against tonnage and tariff discrimination against British goods and granted Britain most favored nation treatment. Finally, with Article 25, it was agreed that nothing in this treaty contained shall, however, be construed or operate contrary to former and existing public treaties with other sovereigns or states, states such as France. Created mainly for the purpose of resolving post-war tensions between the United States and Britain, it was controversial and generally unpopular with the American public, but it did succeed in its goal of ensuring peace between the countries. For a while. The Jay Treaty went beyond just upsetting Americans, however. France was livid. During this time, France was waging a war against the British. Meanwhile, the Americans had just made Britain a most favored nation, denied France both to make treaties in disagreement with that just established, and for them to operate out of American ports. To the French, this treaty was not one for preserving neutrality, but instead the beginning of an Anglo-American alliance. President George Washington had known the French would not like the treaty, and neither did he for that matter, but did not plan for how intense their fury was. On July 2nd, 1796, France made a decree stating that they would treat neutral vessels either as confiscation or searches or capture in the same manner as they shall suffer the English to treat them. This would, of course, include American vessels. Shortly after, the French ambassador was recalled, an ominous indicator of things to come. After this decree, as one might expect, French warships began to prey upon American merchant ships, seizing them under any pretext. They did this partly because they assumed that through America's political divisions between the pro-French Republicans and pro-English Federalists, they would be too divided to effectively fight back. This assumption, while found in reality, would be a critical flaw in the French plan. In March 1797, George Washington stepped down, and John Adams, a Federalist, became president, acting as his vice president, Thomas Jefferson, a Republican. This would be the first time the leader of the opposing political party would be a vice president. But the complexities of Adams' job didn't end there, because only two days before his election, the French issued a new decree stating that the French would seize neutral ships carrying British goods and any American ship which did not correctly present a list of the ship's crew. A list of the ship's crew was rarely even carried on American ships. It was clear now, if war hadn't begun, it was upon the horizon. From October 1796 to June 1797, the French ransacked American commerce, taking over 300 American vessels. And, if the message was not clear, the French also refused the new American ambassador. America had to act. 
but what could it do to retaliate? The country had no navy, and its army wasn't sizable or particularly adept at walking on water. Negotiations were immediately desirable. Perhaps if the Americans could talk their way out of the huge diplomatic rift between the two countries, they could avoid an all-out war. But, on the other hand, seeing as their ambassador had just been declined, maybe it would be necessary to make a navy. John Adams decided to do both, to talk and to arm simultaneously. In doing so, America could build forces to not only prevent the rampage of French seizures, but also get into better bargaining positions, and in retrospect also prove that the French image of a fractured and weak America was delusion. Still, making a navy was a massive feat and unpopular with the Republican Party. It was also fully appreciated that the Americans had no chance of actually defeating a sizable navy in a large battle, and so would have to be fast enough to escape any disadvantageous matchup. At the time, the worry of further provoking the French by arming was also considered. To begin his two-part plan, John Adams summoned a special session of Congress to pass the extensive defense measures, detailed his plan, and mentioned that it was likely that the French thought America was too divided between pro-British and pro-French to effectively fight back, and that America could not let them win on this idea. Adams also suggested arming merchant vessels, and stated that America should stay out of Europe's conflicts, but be ready to fight for its neutrality. The speech went well with the Federalists, but not as much on the Republican end. For example, Thomas Jefferson thought that rearming and talking was a mutually exclusive commitment, and that Adams' defense program would further incite the French. The leader of the Republican House thought that defense measures should be secondary to the federal budget, and that the pro proposed navy was too expensive and would result in significant debts. The debate continued, and on July 1, 1796, Congress passed the act, providing America with its new federal navy. This act would allow for the president to complete the American frigates, Constitution, Constellation, and United States, frigates which would be paramount in the future, and which composed America's first sizable warships. A little over a year later, on July 20, 1797, we returned to where we started. Two envoys leave the United States for France to join their rejected ambassador. When they arrived, the Americans were not received. Instead, three Frenchmen were sent to gather an apology for President Adams' insults towards France in his May 16th address to Congress, as well as requiring a massive bribe. This would become what is known as the XYZ Affair, named after the Americans' dubbing of the agents sent to extract French demands as X, Y, and Z, and was a diplomatic blunder by the French Foreign Minister Talleyrand. The Americans refused, and after months, dispersed throughout the region, while envoy Elbridge Gerry remained in Paris in case any new offer might come, and because Talleyrand ominously warned him there might be war if he left. Back in America, the French Veritude, with a measly two cannons, had just sailed into an American port and burned a British ship and taken two American ones. Something had to change. To further reinforce American fury, the envoys finally arrived back in March 4th, and after hearing about the mistreatment they had faced, Adams was furious. But he calmed himself and assembled a tempered report to Congress. When he reported back, the Americans were convinced that were the dispatches made available, the situation with the French would be revealed to be far less dire. They couldn't have been more wrong. If anything, Adams had been restrained. When the contents of the reports reached the newspapers, America was swept with rage, and America's critical divisions dissipated, while support for Adams rose rapidly. A slogan soon emerged, millions for defense, not one cent for tribute. With this sweep in public opinion, Adams finally had the political traction to really get his navy through, and in April, May, June, and July, 20 bills were passed to improve or more accurately create the military capability of the United States. It can't be understated how immense of a task this was. The army was comprised of only 3,500 men, and of course there was practically no navy, with only the three frigates which weren't ready for deployment, and 15 revenue cutters from the Treasury Department. This means the Treasury Department's fleet was greater than the United States Navy for a time. Thankfully for the Navy, the rearmament effort had begun. The government was now leasing or buying cannon foundries, arms, ammunition, and was to buy, build, or rent 12 additional warships of not more than 22 guns. On April 30th, Adams made the Navy Department, and so the U.S. Navy was reborn. Soon, the first Secretary of the Navy was chosen, Benjamin Stoddart, a man who would be integral in the Navy's development, and was described by Adams' clerk with great praise. A more fortunate selection could not have been made. To the most ardent patriotism, he united an inflexible integrity, a discriminating mind, great capacity for business, and the most persevering industry. Stoddart was a Revolutionary War veteran, and had served as a Secretary of the Board of War, and so also had the experience to back up his actions. As Sartre built the Navy from scratch, he would be joined by a small staff who were also of great skill.
The buildup continued. On June 30th, 24 armed vessels were authored as gifts are on loan from private persons and money was raised to finish the construction of three more frigates. And, with American shipyards experience from the Revolutionary War, ships were being produced at great speed and quality, aided by vital materials sent from Britain such as copper, cannons, and more. At the end of only six months, Stoddard had remade the United States Navy from practically nothing, a truly massive feat. By the end of 1798, he had 21 warships. By the end of 1799, 33. And by 1800, 54. During this time of great military expansion, Republican concerns remained, further amplified by the introduction of the highly controversial and generally regretted Alien Sedition Acts, which were designed to combat a false perception that the French government had infiltrated America and was planning to overthrow them. It was put forward by the Federalists, an outlawed speech with the intent to defame or bring members of Congress or the President into contempt or disrepute, and the Alien Act, which made it so that the President could expel any foreigner by executive decree. Throughout the Quasi-War, the Federalists can be broadly seen as pro-British and pro-Navy, while the Republicans can be broadly seen as pro-French, anti-Navy, and anti-taxation and debt. The Federalists were also for striking against the French, while through their anti-Navy sentiment, the Republicans argued against fighting the French. Throughout the process of making the Navy and expanding the military, the factions clashed constantly, which provided a major factor into the relatively late creation of the U.S. Navy. The Republican anti-Navy sentiment fluctuated throughout the period during, before, and after the Quasi-War, but waned enough to let the Navy flourish during the conflict. And, as the U.S. buildup continued, the Federalists also gained an extreme streak, wanting to invade areas which bordered early America. Moreover, they planned to use their newly expanded army and navy to suppress dissent and use troops to enforce the increased tax selection necessary to fund their military ventures. This would have outraged the Republicans, and was deemed nonsensical by John Adams, a Federalist. At the beginning of their deployment, American warships were tasked with clearing the nation's shores, and on July 6th saw their first success. Captain Stephen Decatur Sr. in the 20-gun Delaware spotted a French privateer off Egg Harbor, New Jersey, and by the next day had claimed the first prize of the war, the 12-gun Croyable, which has renamed the Retaliation. This particular victory would be reversed, however, when in November the Retaliation was sailing near Guadalupe and was separated from its ship group, and became trapped by two French frigates, the 40-gun Insurgent and the 44-gun Volontaire, whereafter the captain, William Bainbridge, was forced to surrender. After only a brief time, the French had been dispersed from America's coast and had retreated into the Caribbean, and with them, the Americans followed. While the American warship's primary objective was to escort the country's merchant ships, they were also on the offensive, attacking French ships wherever they appeared, and raiding French merchants, just as they had done to the Americans. Then, in early summer of 1798, the first large American frigate set to sea, further enforcing America's newborn naval strength. On February 9, 1799, Thomas Truxton, sailing near Nevis, spotted a strange sail on what appeared to be a large warship. Under one of the new American frigates, the 38-gun Constellation, he gave chase. With the wind on his side, Truxton charged towards the mysterious ship and gave the British private signal. There was no response. All hands were ordered on deck, and the chase was on. The ship he was chasing, it turns out, was one of the best French frigates, the 40-gun Insurgent, the very same which had captured the retaliation. As the pursuit continued, a tropical squall swept through the sea and struck the insurgent, cracking her topmast, while Truxton avoided the storm and the constellation remained undamaged. This would prove fatal for the insurgent. The constellation was upon the ship now and blasted the insurgent with a broadside. The Frenchman returned fire. The French captain knew his reduced maneuverability would seal his fate unless he could board the American ship. However, the same loss of maneuverability squandered his attempt to hook the constellation. During the rest of the battle, the constellation circled the ship, keeping out of reach and demolishing the French ship with broadside after broadside. After an hour and a quarter of this, the French captain surrendered. Twenty-nine men were killed on the French side, with forty-one wounded. The Americans had lost two men and had two wounded. Another major battle of the Quasi-War also saw French and American frigates to head. Truxton, still with the constellation, had received intelligence that two French warships were anchored at Guadalupe, one a 44-gun frigate and the other a 28-gun corvette. Truxton decided he ought to give them a fair challenge to come out, and made haste from St. Kitts on January 30th. After an eerily quiet afternoon, the sun had risen on February 1st, and a lookout spotted a large ship to the southeast. Truxton assumed her to be an English frigate and signaled to her, but he received no response, and after further inspection through his long glass, he made a determination. She was a French frigate with at least 54 guns. 
He was exact. The, fr the ship was the French 54-gun La Vengeance, packed with prisoners, soldiers, and money. She was headed back to France and was not looking to pick a fight. Truxton had different plans. Chasing La Vengeance, the Constellation followed her into the evening, where lanterns were lit to provide light. In the darkness, lit only by those lanterns, the Constellation finally reached her prey. She approached the French ship so close that at 8 p.m., Truxton was able to lean over the railing and shout, with a so-called speaking trumpet, at the French captain, demanding his surrender. The French replied with a cannon shot. The battle was on. The Constellation began maneuvering, getting to bear its full broadside. La Vengeance had similar intentions and shattered the night with a broadside of her own. The shots aimed at the Constellation's rigging. The Constellation maneuvered into the wind and took a parallel course to the French ship. The American guns fell upon the French at a range of about 300 yards, and Truxton ordered the ship to fire. The cannons met their target well. Under a half moon, the battle roared on in the dark, with cannons thundering through the night. Both ships were running directly parallel and striking each other with the full weight of their broadsides. To quote Truxton himself, it was as sharp an action as ever was fought between two frigates. The French frigate was larger and heavier than the Constellation, and the American ship was taking brutal damage, with her foresails completely shot away. The La Vengeance began to attempt escape, but the Constellation, with heavily reduced maneuverability, followed, continuing the battle broadsides. The ships sailed dangerously close to one another, and boarding actions were almost attempted, but when the French gathered upon their deck to board, the American Marines and topmen raked them so thoroughly with fire, they abandoned their attempt. After five hours since the first shot had been fired, the French ship ceased firing, indicating surrender, but just at that moment, the Constellation's mainmast began to collapse, and despite attempts to secure it, it crashed down, over the side and into the waves. As the moon was setting, and in the darkness, the light of the Frenchman's lanterns slowly grew more and more distant, and soon the La Vengeance was gone. The battle was over, and both ships had been heavily battered. As the morning rose, men were tasked with clearing wreckage off of the Constellation, and the ship set sail for Jamaica, which was 700 miles away. The Americans suffered 15 dead and 25 wounded. The objective now shifted from hunting the French to saving the Constellation and its crew. Unfortunately for Truxton, when the ship reached Jamaica, she was not offered complete repairs, and so she sailed back to America, and it was there the crew finally learned the fate of the Law Vengeance. After the battle, the French ship had to have water bailed out of her hull, which was now perforated with 200 holes from the American cannons, and was in awful condition. Civilian passengers, along with American prisoners, were also enlisted just to stop the ship from sinking. She struggled across the Gulf of Mexico with only the lower four and mizzenmast, and when she arrived at her desired location, Curacao, her captain decided to drive her onto the beach rather than attempt to steer her through the harbor entrance. This grounding would mark the end for the broken ship. Along with losing the ship, the French had also lost 28 men and suffered 40 wounded, although some reports state even more. Naturally, considering that the French ship had 54 guns, unlike the Constellation's 38, the question arises, how was the Constellation able to win? Though La Vengeance was slightly smaller than the Constellation, it had a broadside which output 187 more pounds of metal. But the French aimed high, they focused on the rigging, which they did decimate, along with felling the American mainmast, but with the downside of being less effective at sinking the ship, as they focused less on the hull. And, in retrospect, it seems the French ship was more concerned with escaping regardless, which would be more easily achieved by disabling the American ship's sails. But another vital factor, which Ian W. Toll points out in his excellent book Six Frigates, which was instrumental in researching for this engagement, the American gun crews acted with incredible speed. While La Vengeance fired 742 rounds during the battle, the Constellation, despite its fewer guns, fired 1,229 shots. The Americans had worked almost twice as fast. The combat and ships had been shifted to the Caribbean, a fact which created some issues for American logistics. America had no base in the West Indies. The ships had to sail from the Caribbean to the U.S. to resupply and vice versa. This made it hard to maintain high numbers of ships. At worst, in the latter half of 1799, almost all of the U.S. ships were back home. One benefit the Americans did have in the Caribbean, however, was aid from Haiti. During the time of the Quasi-War, Haiti was in the process of rebelling against their colonial oppressors, the French, led by General Toussaint. 408,000 408, African slaves fought for their independence and freedom. 
and on June 23rd, Adams lifted the embargo placed upon all France's territories to aid in Toussaint's struggles, and in return, Toussaint prevented French privateers from operating Haitian bases and open Haitian ports to American and British trade. During 1798, when the ambassadors who had been so mistreated in France returned to America, they decided it was unlikely that France won a war, especially since they had hoped for a lack of resistance. They also informed Adams about the status of Envoy Jerry, that he had been forced to stay in France under threat of war. Beyond the resistance, however, France had a greater concern, forcing the Americans closer to Britain, and, after realizing that through the XYZ affair and France's decrees that united the Americans against the French, Talleyrand went to warn the French government, convincing them to revoke decrees ordering attacks on American shipping and release American prisoners. It was now the French who would not anticipate a reaction. In October, Envoy Jarry finally returned from France, reporting not only that the French did not want war, but that the French press were criticizing Talleyrand for his poor diplomacy. While it may seem like the war had already come to a close, the policy had shifted to keeping the naval pressure on France to gain diplomatic leverage, and on August 5, 1799, Talleyrand sent a letter that officially assured the president that the American envoys would be received properly. His strategy seemed to have paid off. On November 3, 1799, the United States under Captain John Barry left America for France. Carrying a chief justice and a governor, they reached France in January, joining American Ambassador Murray, and peace talks had begun in earnest. However, a pivotal change in France's diplomacy had occurred. When the diplomats were only a week at sea, Napoleon Bonaparte overthrew the French government. To the president, this was unsurprising, as from its very inception, Adams had little faith in the survival of the French Republic. But for the ambassadors, this threw an unpredictable element into the negotiations. After six months of negotiations, what was essentially the peace treaty for the Quasi-War was signed on October 3, 1800. The treaty established several things. All American spoilation claims would be abandoned. France would agree to cease hostilities. The old treaties of 1778 were repealed, which had threatened to drag the United States into every French war, and it gave support to the principle of free ships make free goods. Information about the treaty did not reach America until the first week of November, and on February 3, 1801, the Senate passed the treaty. Peace had been achieved, and America had voided an all-out war, built themselves a new navy, and won prestigious victories at sea. For the French, the Convention of 1800, as the treaty was called, had more purpose than simply achieving peace, however. In fact, it was the beginning of a much greater plan. While the Americans assumed that their naval actions, large build-up, and pursuit of diplomacy had won them the day, the French had agreed for other reasons. Napoleon was planning to use the treaty as a basis for future invasion. When reflecting upon the Quasi-War, we can see that it saw the U.S. navigate tumultuous foreign relations, struggling with its first major challenge to neutrality, a challenge which led the U.S. on a warpath, continued the president of arming and talking in U.S. history, and saw rebuilding of the U.S. Navy to a new level, along with a commitment to bring into action a major military force, something many Americans were hesitant to do. It also helps us better understand how the U.S. met in relations with Great Britain after the Revolutionary War, at least for a time, and how the once incredibly close allies, America and France, had a falling out. Despite its lesser known status, the Quasi-War is of paramount importance in understanding a fuller picture of the United States' past.